Hello, everybody. Welcome to this webinar from Progenesis Academy. I kindly ask you to write on our chat your name, where are you from, and if you are a physician, embryologist, nurse, genetic counselor, or if you are a patient, we really appreciate to know your background so we can do this webinar more according. Michelle San Diego, embryologist, Dr. Ingrid, medical doctor, patient. So we have 40 participants. We are just waiting for more minutes to people come in and then I will introduce our speakers. Samantha Wodica, andrologist. Danielle Bowers, Texas patient. Perfect. I think Dr. Pacheco, if you can start the uh, introduction, probably is the right time to start. Do you think I should start? Okay. Yeah, I think okay. So. Are we recording? Um. Yeah, but just a moment, because Thomas and I are trying to um, get the slides to display. Okay. Should just be a few more minutes. So I'm going to start with the introductions. So today our webinar is about uh, genetic testing and IVF. The title is Can Genetic Testing Plus IVF Stepside Genetic Diseases? So we are going to start with Dr. Mili Takur. She's going to speak about preconception genetic testing options, carrier screening, inherited cancer testing, cardiovascular genetic testing, and monogenic testing. Dr. Mili is a medical doctor. She is double border REI and clinical geneticist. She is the founder and CEO of Genome Ally, attending physician at the Fertility Center and assistant professor at Michigan State University. Then Dr. Sarah Aryan will talk about family building for those who are affected by genetic disease and PGTM. Dr. Sarah Aryan is also a medical doctor. She is an REI at Boston IVF, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She is also an instructor of OBGYN and reproductive biology at Harvard Medical School. And finally, we are going to have Dr. Eric Forman, who will speak about age related aneuploidy and PGTA. Dr. Eric Forman is also a medical doctor and HCLD, high complexity lab director. He is a medical, medical and lab director at Columbia University. Irving Medical Center. And at the end, we are going to open for discussion where Dr. Nabil Arash, our founder of Progenesis, and I, Dr. Fernanda Pacheco, Director of Medical Affairs at Progenesis, we are going to open the session for discussions. I encourage all of you to send uh, questions on our Q&A tab. 
and continue on chat saying where you're from and if you are patient, professional, embryologist, doctor. Okay. That's everything for now. And I'm going to pass the word to Dr. Mili Takur. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Um, today, um, I would be talking about preconception genetic testing options. Um, my disclosure is that um, I'm the founder and um, CEO of Genome Ally. So I offer some of these and most of these testing um, through uh, that initiative. Um, I um, All the information that I will be sharing is like pertinent both to, um, you know, medical providers and to patients. So uh, we will be able to get some awareness about some of these um, testing options. Um, next slide, please. So the, this is a list of the genetic tests used in a fertility clinic. One of the key things that I want to like um, have everybody take home today that our patients uh, that are coming to fertility clinics who are trying to build a family are mostly healthy and they're mostly young. So in that case, they do not usually present with like a genetic conditions that are pretty obvious. So the tests that we have to um, offer to them um, are pretty um, um, much in a screening form. So if you go back a slide, please. So these are the tests. So uh, preconception carrier screening is a commonly used test. Another test that we use commonly is a chromosomal analysis, also known as a karyotype. Then for male factor infertility, we do Y chromosome microdeletion testing. Um, for um, women who have gone through a miscarriage, there is a test available for products of conception testing. And then sometimes we would test for genetic conditions where the patient or the partner may be affected called monogenic disorder testing. And then more and more, we are looking into inherited cancer testing for individuals that are seeking family building options. Next slide. So, Lindsay, next, yeah. Yeah, so um, preconception carrier screening is a commonly offered test. Um, usually in this day and age, we are doing pan-ethnic expanded carrier screening. That means that we are combining a lot of disorders that can be screened on in one uh, panel. Uh, these panels can range between 14 to 600 plus conditions. One of the key things for patients on the webinar is that we have about 25,000 genes. We all have some changes on those genes, but they do not affect our health but we are carriers of those conditions very commonly. So these conditions are screened for, for healthy individuals to find out if they are carriers of a certain condition. And if they are a carrier, then if they are going to be um, uh, having a pregnancy with a partner or with donor sperm, we got to make sure that the partner or the donor sperm is not the carrier of the same condition. One of the key things is pre and post test counseling is very important. This testing is done for conditions that are autosomal recessive, like I explained before, and also as X-linked conditions, which you know are usually um, tested in women. These panels are very commonly used. So male partners are usually not tested for X-linked conditions because they're usually not affected by those, but they can be. So when you're offering it to your patients, you know something to keep in mind, this testing is done sequentially. That means, uh, you can test one partner first and then the other partner later, or most clinics are now switching to tandem testing because couples want to know right away if they are a carrier couple, if there is anything more that they should consider. One of the concepts that we teach, you know, um, doctors entering the field or, you know, people who are going to be getting this test is that a negative 
result on a preconception carrier screening means that the risk of being a carrier of that condition is extremely low. And then the risk of having a carrier couple is low, but that risk is never zero because the test is never able to look at every little portion of the gene. So the concept of risk reduction is very common. And then these uh, for uh, providers on the call, you know, variant curation is very important. That means the genetic testing company that offers the carrier screening has to keep looking in databases and make sure that any of the new variants that are available are updated in their system so they can report better. Next slide. So this is a common uh, you know, uh, chart that we use. These are carrier frequencies based on ethnic origin. And as you can see, you know, based on the ethnic background of the individual, you could have a different carrier frequency. So one of the common conditions that we would look for is cystic fibrosis. So in a European American um, ancestry, you know, the uh, ethnic carrier frequency would be one in 25 to one in 29. While if you see that in an African-American population, the cystic fibrosis frequency might be one in 65. And it the disorders also are more prevalent in an ethnic group, but now with like a mixing of populations, we are now doing a broader panel, so it captures everything. Um, next slide. So this is what I was talking about, that the test, when it's negative, is highly reassuring, but it's not completely looking at everything. So there is a risk reduction. So if you look at, say, um, an African-American person, their carrier frequency for cystic fibrosis is about 1 in 65. The test detects about 72% of the uh, changes or variants that there may be, and their carrier risk reduction then becomes one in 232. That means that their likelihood of being carrier is reduced after the test, and that's what we use in the verbiage that we provide to the patients. A negative test is a really reassuring test, though. Next slide. These are uh, some of the technical aspects for uh, the providers on the call. Uh, the next gen uh, gene sequencing for coding regions and splicing junctions are looked at. Um, they are only reporting out pathogenic or likely pathogenic uh, variants according to the ACMG guidelines. Um, they are not looking at the whole gene because that's not possible to look at the whole gene, but they are looking at the very important coding regions and splicing junctions. Then for Fragile X, for um, the doctors on the call, it's very important that we look for Fragile X. FMR1 gene is looked at with a technique called repeat prime PCR. Uh, Premutation carriers are then confirmed with like Sanger sequencing. And then another important thing to look for, and you know we can discuss it later, is like AGG repeats. So if you have AGG repeats in the Fragile X gene, and then the gene is more stable and newer tests are reporting that out if they are in the pre-mutation range. Then there's another very important condition called spinal muscular atrophy. And we look at copy number variants on the SMM, SMN1 gene. And that is done through next gen sequencing and then confirmed by a technique called MLPA. Next slide. Now the results um, for preconception carrier screening about one in two individuals are carrier for a recessive genetic condition. So if two people are sitting in a room, one of them is carrier of an important condition. It doesn't affect their health. They're never going to know that they are a carrier. But when two individuals that are both carrier of the same condition come together, and the risk of that in current situations in most clinics is about one in 50 couples are carrier of the same recessive condition, and then they are at reproductive risk. That means one in four of their children could inherit the non-functioning gene from each parent, and they can have a disease, usually an inherited disorder of metabolism, where an enzyme goes missing, and then there is you know, um, life-threatening conditions that can happen. And then about 2% of women have pathogenic mutation for X-linked genetic conditions. You know, Fragile X is one of them. Duchenne muscular dystrophy is another one of them. And then um, we always talk about reproductive options for carrier couples, so they can still have a natural pregnancy with or without the prenatal testing. Some couples who have carrier, um, who are carrier couple, that means they are in that one in 50 group for an important disorder, they might consider uh, IVF with PGTM, which um, uh, Dr. Arian is going to talk about. 
they can conceive through donor gametes. So like if both of them are carrier of the same condition, they can use gametes for uh, uh, from a donor for um, conception. And then some individuals, you know, try to complete their family by other options like adoption or foster parenting. Next slide. Another common test that we use is chromosomal analysis or karyotype. As you look at on the screen, that's a karyotype image. The test is chromosomal analysis. Basically, they are look, making a picture of the chromosomes in um, a few cells of the blood. And this is by growing those cells and like um, um, developing a test around it. It looks at aneuploidy, which means extra or missing chromosomes. We can look at deletions or duplications that are bigger than 10 MB. We can also look at translocations or inversions where one of the uh, chromosome has switched um, uh, spots with the other one. The detection rate is really high and then there's less false positive rates in this test. Turnaround time is about seven to 10 days. Usually we look at this test for recurrent pregnancy loss. So if a couple is losing pregnancy after pregnancy and our criteria is if they've lost two pregnancy, it's very common to lose one pregnancy. You know, five to 10% women will unfortunately have a loss during their lifetime. But then if they've had two or more losses, then we look for this test. We also look for this test for severe male factor. So if the male partner's count is less than 5 million per ml, then we offer this test because about 10 to 15 percent males with those kind of results will have abnormality in their chromosomes. And then we also do this test now increasingly for recurrent implantation failure. That means that if they are going through IVF and they've transferred many embryos and it's still not working, maybe there is some sort of extra or missing chromosome or you know, deletion duplication in a chromosome that can be causes those kind of abnormalities. Next slide. Um, another test that we do is Y chromosome micro deletion. So when there is azoospermia, that means there are no sperm, or if there is like severe oligospermia, that means less than 5 million. We also look in more detail at the Y chromosome. This testing is done by a PCR based test. And we know that the Y chromosome in the male has important regions, important genes on it that help with like production of sperm. It also helps with development of male sexual organs. So if the sperm count is low, then we look at the Y chromosome in detail. And then these are some of the important conditions that we are looking for. These are the genes that can be deleted or have abnormality in them. If we find a deletion in a, a gene called AZFC, then there is good prognosis to find sperm in a, a testicular biopsy. But if there is AZFA or B deletion, then there is unlikely that the sperm would be found. And then, you know, the couple is counseled based on that area. Um, next slide. Um, products of conception testing is another testing. This is done for um, uh, this is done on the loss. So when a couple has lost a pregnancy or an individual has had a pregnancy loss, then we look at the products of conception. They are submitted for testing to find the reason for the loss. There's many many reasons for pregnancy loss, but one of the common one is an extra or a missing chromosome that just slipped into the first form of the pregnancy called an embryo. Um, this test is done by single nucleotide polymorphism based microarray analysis, and it detects whole chromosome aneuploidy. It detects triploidy, tetraploidy, that means extra or missing chromosomes. It also looks for deletions and duplications more than 5 MB. And then it also looks for a condition called uniparental disomy. In this case, along with the last specimen, we also submit parental blood or buccal swab, and that helps with like finding the parent of origin. So you can tell, okay, did the extra missing chromosome came from the egg or from the sperm? We do face an issue of like maternal cell contamination. So if the loss is submitted and it just contains a lot of blood clots from the maternal side, then they're not able to do the genetic test. But most of the time we get a result, you know, 90% of the time we would know if the chromosomes inside the loss were okay or not. Next slide. Then monogenic disorders is basically when there is a manifestation of a disease in an individual, you know, we can go ahead and do monogenic disorders. 
uh, testing. I do it in my practice because I, in addition to being a reproductive endocrinologist, I'm also a geneticist. So I'm very well versed in those disorders, but most fertility physicians are not ordering these tests. And that's because, you know, we usually don't have individuals seeking care in the usual sense who have genetic conditions, but genetic counseling is a must before any of this kind of testing. We can do single site testing where if the family mutation is known, we can do it with the same lab that their family member had the testing. We can do cascade testing. That means if I found an individual to be at risk for a genetic condition, we can look at other at-risk individuals in their family one of the message to the providers on the call is that we do not use carrier screening for monogenic disorder testing. And that's because the depth of the testing is different. Carrier screening is a screening test in a monogenic disorder testing. We want to go in depth in that gene. And then we have to be aware of variants of uncertain significance. Next slide. And last but not the least, this inherited cancer testing is now being ordered more and more. Most family physicians are not ordering these tests, but you know we are getting better test results now. So one of the things is to do a family history and risk assessment for cancer. Um, I do it quite a lot in my practice where we do multi-gene panels. They, we are looking at like heritable germline disease causing variants in genes associated with cancer. You do need a very good pre and post test counseling. It is a must before you do any kind of cancer testing to find the right genes that you're looking for in the panel. And then you have to be informed because cancer risk kind of changes the trajectory of a patient's you know, course. Like they, are, they need to now have preventative health. It saves lives but then they have to be aware of like, is there life insurance in place? You know, they can't be discriminated against for employment or health insurance, but you know, we have to have a proper counseling before that's done. Next slide. So this is in brief uh, about uh, the genetic testing options. These are my contact information. Please reach out if you have any questions. I will be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Militakur, for the excellent explanation. So now we are going to watch the lecture of Dr. Sarah Aryan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fernanda. Thanks for having me. Uh, I will be talking about pre-implantation genetic testing um, in the setting of family building for those who are affected with uh, genetic disorders. Next slide. So I would like to start by reviewing the terminology associated with pre-implantation genetic testing to understand the steps that are required for pre-implantation genetic testing to be performed, uh, to discuss what needs to be considered for different kinds and types of um, PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing cases, as well as to help understand the limitations and technological uh, challenges associated with PGT. Next slide. So uh, PGT or pre-implantation genetic testing is an option to reduce the risk for a genetic disorder in a pregnancy by using in vitro fertilization or IVF and genetic testing or screening of, of the embryos. We would then uh, be transferring um, the embryos that are not expected to have the genetic abnormality of concern or the unaffected embryos. And so uh, PGT requires IVF as well as genetic testing of embryos. Next slide. Per the ASRM definition, uh, PGT, so ASRM for our patients here, um, is um, our National Society, American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And uh, PGT is defined by a test that is performed to analyze the DNA from the oocytes um, or the embryos at a cleavage stage or a blastocyst stage embryo that is done either for HLA typing or for um, determining uh, genetic abnormalities. There are different kinds of PGT, uh, including PGTA, uh, which is pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploides, um, abnormal number of chromosomes. This was previously known as pre-implantation genetic screening or PGS, which was the old terminology. 
There's PGT-SR, which is PGT for structural chromosomal rearrangements, such as translocations. PGT is also done for HLA typing or HLA matching. And PGT-M, uh, which is the focus of my talk, is PGT for monogenic or single gene disorders. And this was previously known as pre-implantation genetic diagnosis or PGD. Next slide. So what are some of the requirements for the PGT to be performed? Um, in addition to having patients undergo IVF, PGTM requires test setup. Um, oftentimes um, with IVF, HC, which is intracytoplasmic sperm injection, is being performed um, if PGTM is being performed. And this is done to minimize contamination from the cumulus cell mass. Um, the embryos have to undergo biopsy. Uh, followed by genetic testing of biopsied cells, followed by cryopreservation of embryos or freezing the embryos, and then proceeding with a frozen embryo transfer. Next slide. So there are three different uh, time points um, or stages at which um, embryo biopsy can be performed, uh, polar body stage or polar body biopsy, Blastomere biopsy, which is taking um, a blastomere from um, a cleavage stage embryo, which is uh, not as commonly performed these days. And there's also blastocyst biopsy, which is um, the most common methodology or technology that is used uh, for PGTM. And uh, that involves, um, and you can actually advance the slide for the pictures, for the images. So blastocyst biopsy involves um, taking five to 10 cells from uh, the trophectoderm, which is the outer part of the um, blastocyst, which becomes the future placenta, uh, while causing minimal harm uh, to the inner cell mass, which becomes the future fetal parts and fetus. Um, and this is, again, the most commonly used technique. Polar body biopsy can be performed uh, with a caveat that polar body is um, highly prone to fragmentation. And um, uh, it uh, can only help with uh, the maternal contribution or maternal genetic contribution to the developing embryo. And it may be a little more challenging in the setting of monogenic uh, disorders. You can advance the slide, please. So these are just the images. Um, and uh, this uh, last one uh, shows um, a blastocyst biopsy, which is performed from the trophectoderm part of the blastocyst. Next slide. So what are some of the indications for PGTM? Um, historically, um, PGTM has been used for single gene disorders, um, including X-linked disorders. Some of the common ones include Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, fragile X syndrome, and it has been used commonly to prevent from uh, birth of a child that would suffer from a severe genetic disease, mainly in the cases of severe, highly penetrant, uh, non-treatable, um, childhood onset diseases. Uh, it uh, is also used for inherited variants or copy number variants. Um, next slide, please. And so most recently with all the advances in the field of genetics, uh, the indications of PGTM have expanded uh, to a wide range of other um, indications and conditions, including its use for um, single gene diseases that do not develop until adulthood. So there are adult onset conditions such as Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's disease. It is also used for uh, cancer predisposition genes, including BRCA genetic mutations, and for non-fatal but potentially serious conditions that are apparent at the time of birth. Um, PGTM also has uh, the um, advantage um, of um, uh, being able to do sex selection for recessive X-linked disorders, meaning by performing PGTM, healthy male embryos are not going to be discarded, and some female carrier embryos uh, can be identified and uh, possibly used for transfer since they're not affected with the, with the disease. Next slide. Um, so again, with all the advances in the field of genetics, as Dr. Thakur mentioned, uh, with the advances in expanded carrier screening, as well as screening for hereditary cancer disorders, um, the scope of uh, conditions for which PGTM can be performed 
um, have advanced, has advanced. And uh, as you can see here on this graph, um, from 2017 to 2021, there was a 2.5 fold increase in total PGTM cycles, as well as a 5.7 fold increase in PGTM cycles performed for hereditary cancer disorders. Next slide, please. I uh, just wanted to kind of uh, briefly go over this table and show the top 10 genetic mutations and indications for PGTM. Uh, as you can see, BRCA1 um, is the most common one um, amongst others. We can go to the next slide, please. So current standard of practice for PGTM is, used, um, is to use a targeted uh, haplotyping or uh, linkage analysis uh, using intragenic informative polymorphic markers. These are SNPs or um, uh, SDRs, which, which are short uh, tandem repeats. Um, and uh, the test setup oftentimes several takes several weeks um, with the accuracy that has been reported to be greater than 98%. Next slide. So um, how do we set up uh, for PGTM prior to starting the process? Um, individuals who are um, found to uh, benefit from PGTM testing either presents to a fertility clinic with a known um, genetic risk or genetic mutation or are found to um, uh, be affected or carriers of um, a specific genetic mutation throughout their workup at a fertility clinic. Um, it is very important for these patients to receive um, extensive genetic counseling prior to starting the process. And this has to be done by both a lab-based as well as a clinic-based geneticist. So the clinic um, genetic counselors um, need to review with the patients, um, kind of go over the natural history and course of the genetic mutation, as well as um, all the reproductive risks, um, feasibility of PGTM, and um, all other reproductive options. And once the patient has confirmed that they would like to move forward with um, IVF with PGTM, then the lab-based or the laboratory-based geneticist would have to um, counsel the patients uh, regarding feasibility, technical aspects or challenges of PGTM, as well as a timeline. So prior to starting uh, the IVF process, the genetics labs uh, that will be performing the testing uh, they will need to design a genetic test that is specific to the patient um, or to that couple's situation. And for this, oftentimes they need copies of genetic test results, as well as um, samples, including uh, blood, saliva, or DNA samples from uh, the individual or the couple and possibly from their other family members. And um, this uh, will obviously take some time and that's why setting up for the test can typically take up to several weeks. Next slide. So what are some of the considerations uh, with PGTM? Uh, it is important to know that the pathogenic variant um, in the family needs to have been identified, meaning simply having a clinical diagnosis of the condition is not going to suffice. Uh, for this reason, as I mentioned, um, oftentimes samples from family members um, are required, um, whether they are affected with a genetic mutation or they are carriers of the condition. Uh, parents sometimes have to have testing done, first degree relatives, other family members that um, sometimes may have to undergo genetic testing. And uh, some of the conditions, so depending on the genetic variants for some of the de novo mutations or depending on the availability and accessibility of the family members to be um, tested, uh, sometimes PGT may or may not be able to be, to, to be performed. Next slide. So some other considerations uh, with PGTM, not all genetic variants are the same. There are some mutations um, that are more difficult to detect directly with PGTM. Some of these include um, whole gene deletions or large deletions or duplications, um, intragenic inversions, um, some inherited microdeletions, variants in genes with pseudogenes, um, in the setting of uh, use of a donor gamete or donor gamete recipients, um, these conditions may make it a little more challenging for PGTM to um, be performed. Next. 
Um, there are also variants of uncertain significance. And in these cases, um, the laboratory, um, the genetics laboratory will determine feasibility of PGTM um, based on a case-by-case -case basis. There's also PGT for mitochondrial conditions, and these are conditions that are caused by mutations on the mitochondrial DNA. And this is currently not performed in the United States, as well as in many other countries due to issues with highly variable outcomes, as well as heteroplasmy. So it is very important um, that uh, we always check and confirm with a PGTM laboratory that testing can be performed in, in your patient's specific situation, as well as um, discuss with them in advance what are some of the requirements in the patient-specific situation prior to uh, designing the PGTM uh, test and prior to having the patient start the process. Next. What else do we need to know? So PGT uh, does not replace and should not replace prenatal or postnatal testing after pregnancy has been achieved. Um, you may ask if there are, for the patients here, you may ask if there are risks involved with embryo biopsy and um, there, there can be risks involved, um, although usually minimal. And uh, the cost for PGT testing um, depending on where you practice, which state you are, and depending on the type of the genetic variant and the type of the testing that has to be done, and uh, depending on the on the insurance, this is something that may or may not be covered by insurance plans. Next, please. What do we need to counsel our patients about? So our patients need to know that IVF with PGT, PGTM. Uh, does not guarantee a pregnancy. It does not guarantee a healthy pregnancy, by all means. We need to make sure that they understand that prenatal and postnatal testing will still be recommended after pregnancy has been achieved. And this includes any screening testing or confirmatory testing that has to be done during pregnancy. And one thing that is very important, and I find this very important when I'm seeing patients and counseling patients, um, is important to set appropriate expectations, realistic ex expectations, because in reality, obtaining and achieving an unaffected embryo can be challenging because of significant amount of attrition and loss going from the oocyte stage to where we have testable embryos that can be biopsied. Next slide. There are also ethical considerations um, that uh, need to be discussed uh, with our patients. Um, so what will they do? What, what will they, the patients do with their affected embryos? Are they comfortable with discarding their embryos or some would like to maintain them and just keep them frozen? Uh, what will they do um, if they have no unaffected embryos? And for conditions where the cancer risk is higher for a particular sex, um, such as BRCA genetic mutation, would the sex of the embryo matter prior to doing an embryo transfer? If HLA matching is being done, uh, what will they do with their unaffected but non-HLA matched embryos? And in general, what will they do with their remaining embryos once they have completed their family? Are they comfortable with donating their embryos to another individual, another couple, or donating those to science and research? These are all the things that need to be discussed with the patients in advance. Next. There's also another important ethical consideration that I would like to just touch on because um, this is an extensive topic. And uh, we recently had a panel, a discussion panel on this, uh, which was presented at the American College of Medical Genetics. Uh, but one important question for, for us physicians, as well as for the patients, is that if we as the healthcare providers, as physicians, can or should be transferring genetically abnormal embryos per patient's requests, and this is an extensive topic, and we definitely need more policies and regulations and guidelines to be implemented. And um, we need to factor in um, the principles of medical ethics, including reproductive autonomy, as well as justice or fairness and um, beneficence and non-maleficence. Um, but I just wanted to mention that um, per the ASRM statement and guidelines, Transferring an embryo that is highly likely to result in the birth of a child with a serious disease or disability 
can be interpreted as the physician causing harm by facilitating the birth of an unhealthy person. We can go to the next slide. And you can advance again, yes. So in summary, sorry, go back one slide, please. So this is my summary slide. In summary, PGTM should be offered um, if a significant reproductive risk has been identified. Acceptance of PGTM by patients should be an option after discussing all other reproductive options and risks. Uh, patients should have, all patients should really have genetic counseling about their specific genetic mutation, condition, and all uh, reproductive options, as I mentioned, uh, prior to undergoing PGTM. Patients benefit from genetic counseling not only before, but also after PGTM has been done to go over results, uh, particularly when making uh, embryo transfer decisions. And given all the technical limitations and challenges um, that may result in embryo misdiagnosis with PGT, uh, prenatal testing should be still offered for all pregnancies that are conceived using IVF with PGTM not only to confirm the embryo testing results, but also to screen for other congenital anomalies that are unrelated to the indication for PGTM. And lastly, although PGTM uh, or PGT laboratory genetic counselors um, support providers and patients in the PGTM process, all IVF clinics should consider having clinical geneticists on board um, for patient counseling, and this can result in a smoother um, case management process, more efficient workflows, as well as improved patient experiences and outcomes. So thank you, and uh, we'll go over questions at the end. Thank you very much, Dr. Sara. So now, Dr. Eric Foreman, please. Okay, thanks. Those were two great talks. Um, this genetic testing you know, in our field is so comprehensive. So I, I was asked to speak on the specific area that was mentioned briefly and the other talks is aneuploidy or um, having incorrect number of chromosomes, um, which is an age-related phenomena, especially the, the age of the egg. Um, we'll get into that. And pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidies or now called PGTA, Formally, it's been called PGS or pre-implantation genetic screening, but testing is kind of viewed as a, a better term now. Um, you can advance the slide. So I think, um, you know, taking just like a big picture view of this, you know, where we are all talking about potential of sidestepping um, genetic disease. And, you know, I think it's important to think about what our goals, you know, for IVF for genetic testing. So not everyone might agree, but I think we mostly are on the same page that IVF, the goal is really to help individuals or couples to achieve their desired family size, one healthy full-term baby at a time, while we minimize emotional stress that could come from failed cycles, miscarriage, abnormal pregnancies, terminations, if possible. Um, Minimize risk of treatment, which are things like ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, multiple gestation, other complications. And we've done a really good job as we've improved success rates now focusing on making it safer and easier to go through. And then minimize treatment burden. And that could be the cost because it can be expensive, not always covered. And also the amount of treatment one has to go through. So if it can happen success more quickly, that's better. So that's kind of, again, if we're thinking about IVF um, and using genetic testing with IVF, that's the big picture. If we advance the slide to PGTA. So PGTA, you know, we do this a lot um, in some clinics in the U.S. and some parts of the country, not everywhere, but some places are doing almost 100%. Uh, our clinic about 80%, but I know there's other parts of the world and maybe the audience where it's not permitted or legal. Um, but I think it's also important to have some basics on what PGTA is. So whole chromosome aneuploidy, that's where there's a whole extra missing chromosome. You know, that's not really controversial. That is a real phenomena. That is what's found as the most common cause of miscarriage. And we can infer that it's 
probably the most common cause of failed implantation of embryos, both in the body naturally and through IVF. And there's a lot of different lines of evidence pointing to the maternal age, the egg age, as being the major contributor. And that risk, these eggs that, that were in a woman's ovaries from even before she was born, um, at any age can divide their chromosomes incorrectly. I'll show some slide on how that happens, but that increasingly errors occur over age 37 or so. Um, and that's also the age where natural fertility declines more rapidly, miscarriage risk increases more rapidly, risk of ongoing trisomies like, like trisomy 21, 13, 18, those increase mostly from maternal age. Um, but there's really not any evidence that IVF pregnancies are at higher risk of either of mosaicism, which is where there's like a mixed population of normal and abnormal cells. There are some individuals who have mosaicism, there's syndromes, it's very rare, something like around a 1% or, or higher of ongoing pregnancies, but it's, it's not ever been shown to be increased by IVF and was not something that really like PGT was developed to eliminate. Um, similar with full segment where there's a portion of a chromosome that's extra or missing. We don't think that's caused by IVF or more common in IVF and PGT wasn't designed to eliminate that. Most embryos come from an egg and well, all embryos come from an egg and sperm that come together. And if they have the correct number of chromosomes, that results in a normal embryo. And if the divisions to make daughter cells go correctly, that's euploid. If it comes from an abnormal egg or sperm that has an extra missing chromosome, again, most of the daughter, if not all the daughter cells, when they divide, will have the same copy number. And so this is an assumption that some, some would counter, but I believe that most embryos are fully euploid or aneuploid, there may be some errors in some mosaicism that's again, we can discuss, but an intermediate copy number, which is what's kind of been inferred as a mosaic result. So when PGTA is done, as we saw some pictures of biopsy, a few cells are biopsied, the cells aren't individually seen. Like in Dr. Thakur's karyotype you know, discussion, you could actually see the chromosomes from multiple cells. That's not happening. This is a molecular test where DNA is amplified and you can't really tell if it's truly mosaic. It's a copy number that's somewhere between the normal and the abnormal. So it doesn't really like, again, prove the presence of abnormal cells. So these are some of my assumptions, which open for discussion. You can go to the next slide. So, um, this is describing the process of meiosis and meiosis is where germ cells like eggs and sperm mature and have to divide their chromosomes. And this is showing from an egg, that's the gray, the gray circle at the top has two copies of each chromosome and each chromosome has a chromatid. So it's like two copies. And there's two divisions. There's meiosis one that happens at ovulation and the second little circle that blebs off, that's a polar body. And that should divide in half, like one chromosome should go to the polar body, one should stay in the egg. That's this green um, circle. And then the second meiosis division occurs at fertilization when the sperm comes in, that's the white chromosome. So if you go all the way down sort of to the left, there's green, green, and that's normal meiosis too. And so when you heard about polar body biopsy, that's what this is talking about. It's not really done so much in the U.S. anymore and could be a whole nother discussion, but you could actually sample those polar bodies and infer what the egg kept by knowing what it discarded or threw out. But the interesting thing is there's a lot of different ways in how it can go wrong. So it can throw out all the chromosomes and have none. And then there's really no opportunity to fix that because has no copies of that chromosome. The sperm brings one copy and that's a monosomy. That's the top left arrow. And that's called non-disjunction, which is thought to be the leading cause of, of aneuploidy. It actually probably is not, at least in humans, but that's a longer discussion. And non-disjunction 
leading to trisomy is also shown in kind of the pink. Um, but there's there's other opportunities where the chromatids separate prematurely that actually this can correct rarely. So testing chrome polar body one is doesn't really tell us the full story. Um, we kind of have to go to the embryo. But the point of this slide is just that it's kind of complicated. Errors can happen. And as, as the eggs get older, they're more prone to make these errors. And uh, a thought is that, again, the, the chromosomes stick together or the chromatids separate prematurely even before like the full my meiosis division. Next slide. This is, this is just some study I did when I was a fellow a long time ago, but this shows non-disjunction is that little like red box and pre premature separation of sister chromatids is the blue box. By looking at uh, microarrays of polar bodies, we were able to actually show that that that, that non-disjunction, which is still in textbooks happens, but it's actually not as common. And there's the separation of the sister chromatids is probably more what is causing the age-related aneuploidy as women get older. Uh, next slide. And this is showing one example of an abnormal karyotype, trisomy 13, trisomy 21 gets a lot of attention, but actually this is a much more severe syndrome. It's less common, but it's one of the, one of the conditions that's screened for in non-invasive prenatal testing early in pregnancy. And this is clear, like when a, when a, karyotype is done. You could clearly see three copies. You could check multiple cells, but this is not what it looks like when PGTA is done. Next slide. And so, again, like I mentioned earlier, but just to reiterate the point that aneuploidy increases dramatically with maternal age. That blue box on the left is showing IVF success with one's own age. Well, own eggs, I mean, this is an old slide from the CDC more than 10 years ago, but the same will basically hold even now that the orange bar shows as women get over that age, I mentioned 37, success rates decline dramatically. And this was when there wasn't much genetic testing of embryos and multiple embryos are being transferred. But again, the same would hold. But if using donor eggs, so the same age woman using her uterus to carry even at 44, 45 has very similar success rates to mid thirties. So that kind of proves that it's not the uterus, although there may be some subtle changes. It's probably not the sperm because those women, as they get older, their, their partners also on average are older. It's mostly the egg. And then even if a pregnancy occurs naturally, so some would say, oh, well, maybe maybe IVF causes these abnormalities because of stimulation. Maybe the, the egg that wouldn't have been ovulated are abnormal. There's really not good evidence for that. And, and all of the data on risk of trisomies, miscarriages, that comes from natural pregnancies and that risk increases dramatically. If the pregnancy is ongoing, the risk of an ongoing aneuploidy is much higher in the late 30s, early 40s. Next slide. And so when we're thinking about PGTA, um, again, and this is a, a short presentation, there's a lot you know we could talk about, but I mean it's important that we get the the result correct because that's why screening wasn't a great term. If the embryo is called aneuploid, most centers do not transfer, although you heard earlier there's some discussion about transferring. Most do not retest, they just discard. This is a summary of multiple studies that looked at retesting for research purposes, not for um, like clinical use, just to look at the reliability. And you could see, I mean, these are different companies, different labs um, that, you know, when a euploid embryo is retested, it, it not always, but usually comes back euploid, sometimes mosaic, and, and most clinics now are more comfortable transferring mosaic sometimes even full aneuploid. So that's, you know, is that, was that embryo truly mosaic? Is there a false positive? The aneuploid, I mean, this is actually, you know, more concerning that, you know, there's this blue bar in there when the aneuploid retest, that means it was originally aneuploid. It would have been called abnormal, but on a repeat biopsy, it came back normal. So again, is that 
is one of those, like a false positive, a false negative. But interesting, again, the mosaic ones don't really correlate. Like many of them come back normal, some come back mosaic, and some come back full um, aneuploid. Go to the, the next slide. So there was, a, there was a nice study on a next generation sequencing platform Julia Kim published that did blinded rebiopsies. And, and as the technology's gotten better, that prior slide I was showing that uh, the reliability actually in earlier forms of pre-implantation genetic testing that didn't necessarily use next generation sequencing and didn't call mosaic results. Remember I said earlier, the whole point was really to find out if there was a full chromosome abnormality, but the technology has gotten better. And this technology uses a targeted um, sequencing and SNPs um, and kind of beyond I think the, the discussion here, but if done really carefully, it's still not perfect, but highly accurate that the ones that are normal, very, very often 99% come back um, normal and abnormal comes back fully, not mosaic range. So, so with improvements in the field, I think, and you know, doctors and clinics and patients should you know, be looking at validation um, this can reliably reflect truly what the state of the embryo is and what you know the vast majority of its cells are, even if we sample the outer part and we're trying to infer what the inner part that makes the baby is. Next slide. So, so there's been, you know, there were earlier versions of pre-implantation genetic testing or screening back then that used earlier technologies like something called FISH where individual chromosomes were tagged fluorescently and it was one cell, it was that blastomere biopsy that Dr. Arian mentioned. There was a lot of problems and it didn't work and studies, randomized studies actually then showed it was not improving outcomes, which was frustrating and a big setback, but it was not really that the, the concept of testing and knowing if the embryo is normal or not you know, is not valuable. It's just that stage of biopsy probably wasn't the safest stage and the technology wasn't accurate enough. With newer, more comprehensive methods, there finally have been some studies showing improved implantation and live birth rates. Um, but these were all actually like 10 years ago now already. And none of these three studies actually use next generation sequencing. So mosaicism wasn't part of the diagnosis. Embryos that would have been called mosaic now probably would have been called normal and transferred. Next slide. And so those those randomized controlled trials, I mean there's been criticism because they all they all showed uh and they all looked at patients that made blastocysts that tended to have high numbers of eggs had multiple blastocysts available for biopsy that was usually at a single center that were pioneers in doing a lot of this work on biopsy and testing. Back then, it was a lot of fresh transfers. The technology was more amenable to that, and it was done in a single center. And again, it wasn't really looking at mosaicism. Next slide. So there was this, this multi-center trial when next generation sequencing came out in multiple countries and multiple labs that looked at next generation sequencing, hoping this technology will be better. And this will show that that PGTA really improves the results. And again, frustratingly, um, for those who like, you know, believe that the concept can work, there's some who just think the biopsy is not safe, the technology will never be accurate enough. But I believe if it's done correctly, it can improve outcomes. And it this didn't show success really. When it was broken down into age groups, it did show higher live or ongoing pregnancy for over a 35 age group, but that really wasn't the, the design. So that's a little bit cheating to, to go back and look at it that way. But there are, again, there are a lot of reasons why this might have happened. One, a significant proportion um, of the patients that were randomized to have PGTA didn't have a transfer but a lot of these patients had an embryo in the mosaic range that again, now most of us with counseling would say, if they don't, if that's the only embryo available, 
were getting live births and those would have had a transfer and that would have improved the outcomes in that PGTA group. Also, there's concerns about the reliability of the assay, different genetic labs, again, that had different experiences. The average age was 33 and over 40%, only 43% of the embryos were normal, which doesn't really fit with the kind of aneuploidy rates or proportion that are normal, abnormal that we're seeing, which I'll show in a bit. So some concerning findings. Next slide. This is, this is a randomized trial that, that I led, again, more than 10 years ago, that looked at single blastocyst transfer of a normal embryo, and it was using real-time PCR, a different method. But in this study, the average age was 35, and almost 70% were normal, whereas in that STAR trial, the average age was even younger, but significantly fewer were normal. So that's you know getting at a problem. You know Are all PGT labs and assays the same? I don't think so. And if we're overcalling abnormal embryos, that's a problem. It might not be helping. Next slide. And this is just showing example of you know two different. The one on the right is the genetics lab that, that we work with, where even up to age 39, the, the, the proportion that are abnormal is below 40%. But that's flipped around that even under age 35, only 60% are normal at the, in this published study of more than 12,000 embryos at a, a large center that has their own PGTA method. So it's concerning that maybe in some tests, some embryos that are being called abnormal you know, could have potential. Next slide. And there was a large uh, randomized trial in China that got a lot of attention. It was in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most prestigious journal. The purpose of the study was to look at whether pre-implantation genetic testing could improve cumulative live birth, um, but it's really a selection tool. We can't really get more babies from the embryos. The purpose members you know, sidestepping disease, sidestepping aneuploidy, so removing the aneuploid so that there's less miscarriages, maybe fewer transfers that don't work, less ongoing aneuploid. And again, this study was also, again, designed in a way that, that I think was interesting and probably not ideal way to look at PGTA. Next slide. It had mostly young patients. Average age was 29. So that's younger than the average population using PGTA generally. Even if these patients had five or seven blastocysts, they only biopsy three of them, which we usually test all of them and we can select from them. So they didn't necessarily have an opportunity to even transfer all of the normal embryos. And even with all of that, it's been, you know, it's been sort of presented as showing that PGTA isn't necessary, doesn't improve things, but actually a lot more patients in the group without PGTA had transfers that didn't work there were like nearly twice as many patients that had a second and a third transfer and in the end had similar number of babies. So it's a lot more transfers and each transfer is weeks of preparation and emotion and then not getting pregnant. So even in this young, so, so there were a lot fewer transfers and there were fewer miscarriages, even in this young population that the miscarriage risk was only you know, 12%. But it was reduced to nine percent significantly with PGTA, and also this study was done at a time where mosaic diagnosis was controversial, and some of those patients probably would have had more ongoing pregnancies, and and the difference at all, you know, would have been less. So, I think if anything, if you do it, if you interpret this study, it can be interpreted in a positive way for PGTA. Next slide. So I think it's important, when, as I said earlier, that you know when we do these studies, when we look at PGTA, that we that we have data on how accurate the result is, and that you know that we know that the result is correlating to the status of the embryo, whether that's blinded rebiopsy studies or what's called non-selection or predictive value studies, basically transferring embryos doing a biopsy and then running the biopsy later and seeing if it would have been called abnormal, would it have resulted in 
a live birth, that's concerning and that should almost never happen. In this particular study, it never happened. Doesn't mean it would never happen, but it it should be very rare. But but it did result in a lot of miscarriages that could be prevented. Next slide. So again, I think it's important that we, you know, we look at our own data. It can drift over time. You know, we shouldn't be having really high aneuploidy rates in young patients and donors. You know, we should, again, validate our um, embryologists who do biopsies and, and make sure that they're doing them correctly. Blinded rebiopsies, you know, should be consistent. Um, and so, again, just one labs example, but um, this slide, actually, I didn't update this from a presentation I gave a while ago, but... But in young patients, like around 80% of embryos should be normal or transferable if we transfer mosaic embryos. Next slide. And I think, you know, a big benefit is that we're finally seeing um, near universal single embryo transfer. Finally, the ASRM included the American Society for Reproductive Medicine that if the embryo is normal, you should transfer one at a time. For a long time, they've been saying you should transfer one embryo, and and most places we're transferring two, three, and then for older reproductive age patients, you know, those patients are higher risk pregnancies, and and sometimes there would be two normal, and they would have twins or even triplets. So, so gen, that's not necessarily a genetic disease, but it's helped improve the safety, reduce the burden, and also help plan for the future, knowing what else you have frozen. Next slide. And this is showing like not that long ago when I was in my training, single embryo transfer was really rare, like less than 10%. And that was probably mostly because they only had one embryo. Like most of the time, multiple embryos were being transferred. And now nationwide without like absolute laws or requirements, I think we're at something like 80% single embryo transfer and some clinics are 100%. Next slide. When we think about, you know, PGTA and using it to avoid, you know, genetic abnormality, and I think there's a role and it should be offered as long as the limitations are described. So even younger patients, um, I mean, they usually benefit from freeze-all approach. They may have a higher response. Um, it's going to be really hard to show benefit. Um, so it's not absolutely required or shouldn't be, shouldn't be required, but for patients that want to have more than one child and want to know what they have frozen, it's reasonable. But multiple studies are now showing for the old, older reproductive age group, there's a higher live birth rate per transfer, which, you know, again, does matter. A failed transfer is really difficult and some patients delay or don't come back. Lower miscarriage rate. Um, and also can be helpful that if you're trying to have a second child two years later, you might not be able to make another normal embryo. So if you only have one, it might be better to do another egg retrieval before transfer. With donor egg, there's really not any proven benefit. Um, and we expect 85, 90% of them to be normal. But if using a gestational carrier, I think it's really something that, that should be strongly considered. A lot of carriers you know, come from states where termination might not even be legal. So even though the risk is low, it's another risk we can minimize. And recurrent loss, it makes sense, especially if we know it's due to chromosomally abnormal pregnancies, but there's not really great studies proving that. That would be nice to see. Next slide. And as we heard before, like I can't guarantee a healthy baby. Um, you still should do testing in pregnancy. It can't detect, you know, every mutation or even small copy number variations. Um, it can't, you know, if, the, if there are no normal eggs or no normal embryos, it can't improve that. And so it's not very effective over age like 43, where it's very, very difficult to make even one normal embryo. And then advanced paternal age, we didn't talk about that much, but it's considered over age 50. There's known to be a risk of new mutations that could happen randomly, not something that's being passed down. So even if the screening panels that Dr. Thakor mentioned are negative and don't carry anything, something new could develop in the sperm. And there's increased risk. This is maybe 
future direction of PGT. Can we pick up these things reliably and not have false positives? But we can't necessarily sidestep the risk if we use sperm from someone in their 50s. Those risks are still very low, but we can't really even minimize that risk. Next step, next slide. And as you heard earlier, again, there's a lot of, again, criticism of PGTA that, that you're discarding or throwing away embryos. I think this is changing and, and my clinic no longer automatically discards anything. We make sure patients, they decide if they would never transfer the embryo. Mosaic embryos are being transferred and do really well. And even aneuploid, this is a study going on at Stanford, but some clinics are willing to take and transfer aneuploid embryos. Next slide. Sorry, that was kind of long, but in summary, you know, modern ART, IVF, which you talked about, you know, it used to be tra transferring multiple embryos and see what sticks, but now with freeze-all, single embryo transfer, we didn't get into all of this, but minimizing OHS ovarian hyperstimulation and multiples risk, it's gotten safer, and we can really finally do near universal single embryo transfer. Some patients may not have a transfer, but but again, there'll be fewer futile transfers. We'll avoid some clinical miscarriages, which maybe let patients try again sooner and terminations or ongoing abnormal pregnancies. You know, you can transfer abnormal embryos as a last resort. So they should be kept until a couple is sure that they don't need their embryos. And we can't really mitigate the risk of advanced paternal age, which I just mentioned at the end, but that's an area, hopefully, for future research and development. So that um, concludes my talk. I think there's one more slide just showing my team at Columbia, but um, be happy to take questions with the rest of the excellent panel. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Eric, very much for your excellent lecture. Very detailed. Thank you. So now Thank I'm you. going to open for discussions, okay? I know that Dr. Milita Kura already answered some questions, but I'm going to to read because then we can uh, have discussion and this question can serve for other people. So we have some patients, but the majority, I believe, are doctors, embryologists, or biologists that work in genetic unity inside IVF centers? Okay, so the first question to Dr. Mili and also Dr. Sarah. What is the recommended test for a potential mother diagnosed with Cruzon syndrome? I'd like you to explain a little bit, Dr. Militakur, what is this syndrome, uh, how we make the diagnosis, and how would you counsel this patient in at your office? This patient is looking for IVF. Yeah, so Crohn syndrome is a uh, autosomal dominant genetic condition with a mutation in the FGFR2 gene. Uh, which is like important for like um, bone and skin development. So it's a clinical diagnosis that is then confirmed by um, genetic testing. So the gene shows a change and the options for, um, you know, a mother who already has the uh, Crohn syndrome would be that, you know, because it's an autosomal dominant condition, half of her eggs will carry the mutation. And so one in two children are at risk of being affected. Um, we would um, see that patient and do genetic counseling for them where we would, um, you know, discuss the different options. You know, they can still choose to have a natural pregnancy um, and go through testing during pregnancy, but they can also opt for something that uh, Dr. Arian mentioned, which is called IVF with PGTM. Uh, that's like um, a test where embryos are made by combination of egg and sperm. So the woman has to go through injectable medications for two weeks. We retrieve the eggs out. We grow them in the lab to become an embryo that is day five or day six old. And then we take some cells out of the outer shell of the embryo. We do the biopsy and then test them for that FGFR2 gene. 
But like, as Dr. Foreman had mentioned in one of his slides, you know, when we are doing testing on an individual or an adult or a child, we have millions of cells to look for. But when we are doing testing on embryos, we have only four or five cells. And so we have to develop the test for that family. So for that mother, we would counsel and then we would develop the test for them. So we are able to look at the embryos for that genetic mutation because there are so less cells and we use a technique called whole um, genome amplification we have to do um, the test development through either um, linkage or karyo mapping. So we have to trace the gene change. So it's difficult to read the exact gene change, but we are able to develop a family tree and link that gene to certain um, uh, STRs, which is single tandem repeats. And we will then be able to tell with quite a lot of accuracy if the embryo has it. So the results will come back where we would have, say, say this individual had five or six embryos submitted, we would know that embryo number one has the gene change or not. And then this will be for each of the embryos. Most um, individuals, most women will also test the embryo for PGTA, which Dr. Foreman mentioned. So like we want to make sure that they don't have the gene change for Krausen, but they also all have the right amount of chromosomes. So we will look for PGTA and PGTM and then pick the embryo that is normal for both of those. Usually the um, efficacy or you know the accuracy of the test, because we are looking at a few cells from an embryo, ranges from like I would say 92 to like 99%. It is it has to be told to the patient, counseling has to be done that, you know, we are able to read it with quite a lot of accuracy, but it's a it's a test on a microscopic structure. But most patients will go through that whole process and then be able to have a successful pregnancy if they go through it. That was an excellent answer. Actually, you ended up answering my question that it would be if you would counsel PGTA for a neoploidy together with the diagnosis of the monogenic disease. Yeah. You always recommend. Yeah, we always recommend. It doesn't and matter the age of the patient. Doesn't matter the age of the patient. And that is mostly done for two reasons. One is that the single gene disorder is being inherited by the pattern of autosomal dominant, but then the chromosomes are coming randomly together. There is an age-related risk, but even for young patients less than 35, there is a risk of extra or missing chromosome aneuploidy is still there. So we do find embryos that are normal for that genetic condition like Krausen syndrome, but they will have an extra or missing chromosomes. And many labs are now doing testing where they first look for PGTA, find out which one of those are the embryos that have the right chromosome and then test for the chromosomal for the monogenic disorder. So it's done in sequence sometimes. Okay. I want to add here, um, sorry, I just wanted to add that if you think about it from a cost benefit perspective and logistics standpoint, and also ethically, I mean, the patients are already going through the entire process of IVF and getting the testing done. So the last thing you want is to transfer an embryo that is aneuploid, but not affected with that genetic mutation. So um, as Dr. Thicko mentioned, it's just best to offer um, and perform both. Awesome. Dr. Nabiwa Rash, if you want to interrupt, if you want to add something, please. No, I think Dr. Takur has explained it very well. Um, the aneuploidy and the single gene mutation are two separate events. They, they don't necessarily, uh, they're not related. So, and the benefits is sometimes patients that have very limited number of embryos uh, and has to do multiple cycles, it's probably better to look at euploidy first um, to rule out the aneuploidies and then focus on just adding more. It depend, depends on the, the, the need of a specific uh, patient. Each, each patient is different. Um, but for those patients that have a lot of embryos um, and can afford to uh, the cost of the test, then they can test everything and then it will save time. So is time is it important time or 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 having you know at least one embryo to transfer? But uh, yeah. I have a question uh, uh, for for the panel. It actually, is is a comment that was raised by Dr. Awadala. 
uh, regarding sex uh, discrepancy between uh, PGTA and, and pregnancies. Um, what's in your opinion? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it, well, he said it's a growing trend. I don't know. I'm not sure if that is an actual uh, uh, precise statement. But what would be the source of discrep discrepancy between uh, results provided by a lab and then the pregnancy in terms of gender? If you guys could... Uh, yeah, I can, I can talk to that. It's an area I'm interested in. Um, so... Yeah, I think it's like you said, it's hard to know. Um, as he mentioned, not many people report on this or publish on this, but I think Cooper Genomics did do a review of discrepancies they presented at last ASRM. I don't know if it's published, not just sex discrepancies, but other. Um, and there's you know several different points at which there could be a discrepancy for sex, again, or for you know other reasons. So, I mean, this process is complicated so from the the biopsy making sure that biopsy is from the embryo that that it's you know labeled as and goes to that tube that it's labeled as and gets shipped to the pgt lab and that they amplify that dna and it stays you know as that number and then and then that the reaction whatever assay they use is is correct and correlates to the embryo, which for sex should be like 99.9%. Um, then that's, you know, bioinformatics and data entry that, that, that gets transcribed correctly into some type of report that goes back to the doctor who then selects embryo to transfer. And that, that embryo that's thought again is the one that, you know, that they said the biopsy was, and that goes to the patient and that patient definitely gets pregnant from that embryo. Um, and so I, something could happen at any step of the way. So, you know, there could be on the embryology lab side, a discrepancy that, that the embryo that was trained, the biopsy that was analyzed somehow is not actually from the embryo. I mean, no one wants to talk about these things, but there's, and embryology labs are busy, complicated place that shouldn't happen. There should be, you know, clear, um, checks to make sure. Similarly, there could be, again, a data entry error on the PGT lab side. And then also, depending, you know, we're doing more and more natural cycle frozen embryo transfers. So these are usually frozen embryo transfers. Um, we tell patients not to attempt pregnancy naturally, but it's possible that a patient could get pregnant naturally from an egg that she ovulates and the embryo that's transferred actually didn't result in the pregnancy. Um, and I think all of these different possibilities have happened. So I think, you know, when something like this happens, again, I like to be transparent with patients, with labs. I think everyone should, um, you know, be open and try to get to the truth. So the lab that's testing. So then again, how do you know the sex of that the pregnancy? Is it NIPT? Is that confirmed? Is it then, you know, ultrasound? Is it amnio, CVS? So, so, you know, be sure of the diagnosis first, because sometimes it's not really a discrepancy. Maybe it's false positive NIPT or data entry error by somebody. Um, so everyone should look closely at, at their situation. Um, yeah. And then, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry. But I think, again, I mean, I mentioned this is beyond the scope, but I mentioned earlier the idea of using SNPs. I mean, I think there, you know, there is the potential then if it really does look like there's a discrepancy to get DNA if amnio is performed or CVS and compare to DNA that, that the PGT lab has often stored excess amplified DNA and they can see, you know, was it that embryo? Was it a different embryo? Was it not even a sibling embryo? So maybe a patient got pregnant on her own. So there are ways to get to the truth. I would say probably that's the most, you know, the the spontaneous unassisted pregnancy. You know, I would like to think that's the most common because the other ones are errors. But um, again, there was a review on this by Cooper Genomics. I, I think maybe data entry, you know, is, is maybe another leading cause because there's a lot of steps where 
it could be entered incorrectly in a report or in an EMR. But yeah, Nabil, what, um, you were going to say something. Yeah, could maternal contamination contribute to this? Um, um, yeah, so I mean, or, or any thing. contamination. So if it's uh, you know a normal female embryo, and there's somehow DNA from a male embryologist potentially, that's theoretically possible. That's another area though where, if used correctly, I think SNPs could pick up on you know patterns that look like there's you know multiple sort of parents so I, th I think in the future some of those could be detected up front if it's a non-sibling embryo if there's contamination but yeah that's another potential explanation and then there, and then there are true like sex reversal syndromes that you know are very rare again but i mean that kind of thing would need to be investigated if it's you know again genetically one sex but appearing like a different one on ultrasound and again but then the genetic result you know should match what the pgt lab found thank you guys i'm going to bring some data we had about 80 attendees and we had six six questions uh, which were answered online by Dr. Mili. So I'm going to jump to the five questions that are still open. So a comment from a physician, uh, congratulations all the speakers and thanking, uh, she thanks uh, you speakers for putting all together and making her to improve her understanding of genetics. So uh, we see that even among physicians, Genetic is still like difficult and imagine uh, among patients. So we still need a lot of education in this area and these kind of meetings are very important. Thank you very much. So uh, Dr. Foreman, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. You said that you, in your clinic, you don't discard any embryo anymore. So one person asked, how expensive, no, sorry, how would you justify or cancel a patient paying storage for aneuploidy embryos? And then I'm going to add another question from a doctor from Brazil, my colleague. Uh, he asked if you, uh, uh, do you consider to transfer all kind of mosaic embryos if euploid mm -hmm. is not available? Yeah, so not that we don't that we don't discard any embryos. We don't like automatically discard embryos. So it's not like I think there's some clinics maybe still. It used to be more common that if it came back aneuploid, they were discarded maybe to have less storage. Even if patients consented to that, I think they didn't maybe completely understand, you know, until they go through. So we just make sure that, you know, when if they have only aneuploid embryos they sign, you know, forms to discard or donate to research and it doesn't happen like without confirming because there are clinics, we don't transfer full aneuploid, but there are clinics that would, there are people out there who say, again, there's a question about self-correcting, trisomy 13 in the chat. I don't, again, if it truly came from an egg that has an extra copy of chromosome 13, a meiosis error, that really cannot self-correct, I don't believe. So again, if we really have reliable results, but there are people out there saying such things, and again, the patient, you know, should have the ability to move their embryos if if they would be open to transferring. Um, and then mosaic embryos, again, there have been, you know, live births, you know, from many live births now and close to none that show any you know, evidence of the mosaic finding or intermediate copy number finding. So low, low level mosaics, some studies are showing perform basically the same as ones without mosaicism. If you buy rebiopsy normal embryos, it's not uncommon that they'll have a low mosaic finding in another biopsy. So um, the high mosaic, again, I mean, some PGT labs differentiate this. I think the most important thing is that the, the PGT lab and their methods, they're confident that this is 
not like full aneuploidy where every cell is abnormal that came from an abnormal egg or sperm. And that's again, another area where single nucleotide polymorphism SNPs or maybe other methods in the future can, can help because if it's a monosomy, for example, you know, the copy number will be low, but also you'll have, you know, homozygous for all SNPs. So there's, there's ways that we're getting better at this. So basically if we're confident that it's truly mosaic, that it wasn't from a meiotic error, we're open to transferring, you know, all of those. And I, I mean, I think it's reasonable in general. Can you add something, uh, Dr. Nabil, about uh, uh, yeah, so my or, question, what yeah. you're ranking for mosaics? I know you. Yeah. Well, okay. our perspective on mosaicism is a little bit different, uh, 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 different from the, you know, kind of general opinion across labs. Uh, my personal opinion about mosaicism is that the very small minority is actually true mosaic and the rest is just artifact. And we've been talking about this for a long time. When we do re-biopsy of mosaic embryos, uh, and our rate is only 2%, it's very low already, only 20% come back confirmed with the same uh, mosaic call, and that is a 0.5%. So if you divide 2% by 5, that's, you know, it's a very small fraction of what, you know, we see in other reports. And um, and all this uh, theory about self corrections and uh, you know it, it could be just we're just simply uh, dealing with artifacts and noise uh, and that noise can come with a variety of sources we have done we have compared uh, a sequencing platform and we see clear differences between mosaicism rate just by looking at the platform. <laughs> But also, when you look at embryologists, we have analyzed more than 140 embryologists looking at rates of mosaicism, and you see a, a variation from 0.5 to 5%. So there are lots of sources that create that noise it, it, from lab to genetic lab to, an IV, to the IVF lab. Um, and, and so uh, really, all the studies doing transfer of mosaic embryos show that the majority of low, what they are calling low mosaic embryos behave just almost like a euploid class. There's a very small difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, you know, think about a biopsy almost like a, uh, you know, test, a pathology test. When you, when you give a slide to a pathologist, they're looking, they're trying to assess that tissue they don't have any other tissue to, 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 to assay. It's only one sample, one time opportunity. And if anything in that preparation is off, it could lead to artifacts. That's the biopsy is the same situation. You have a, a very small material that was prepared in a certain way, and you're trying to get the best call yeah. possible. But the reality is the limitations that are surrounding the preparation of the of the sample and the amount of DNA and all that create that limitation that, that uh, you can always deal with, you, you will always deal with noise. Maybe future technology, as Dr. F uh, Foreman was saying, may enable a better detection, uh, SNPs, STR, and other things, and maybe non-invasive combined with AI and all these things may enable a better detection but uh, that's the limitation we're dealing with and i wanted to add to everyone's points that um i mean once again the role of genetic counseling i mean these patients we have them uh receive extensive genetic counseling um, when they are planning on having uh, a mosaic embryo transferred and obviously depending on uh, the chromosome that is involved and uh pgd international society has some guidelines regarding what type of chromosomal aneuploides you would be more comfortable with transferring as opposed to the ones that are um, highly associated with increased likelihood for having for, uh, congenital anomalies. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Um, another question, how expensive is PGTM with IVF if insurance doesn't cover? Can you answer? 
Yeah, so um, uh, I, I, I could cover two questions. I think there's like a question of like, is it is PGTM a panel or is it like um, developed for the family? So I think the cost of PGTM is high because you have to develop the test for each family. Um, basically what happens is because we are looking at very few cells in uh, the PGTM test from an embryo, um, you mostly are not able to look at the direct mutation. You have to do linkage or karyo mapping. So we have to develop the test for that particular individual. The test development process can take, usually in my experience, it takes about three to six thousand dollars. You know, you, and then based on where you live, there will be the cost of IVF. So for patients to find out the true cost of the whole cycle, they have to like find out wherever they live closest, how much IVF cycle cost. And it ranges from different places. So like it can range between 15 to about $25,000 in my experience, you know. So uh, you have to have the cost of IVF, cost of IVF medications, and then the test development for PGTM. Awesome. And to add that, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, Millie, I practice in the state of Massachusetts, which is an IVF mandate state. So it ends up becoming a lot less. And depending on the type of insurance, some insurances cover the cost for PGTM as well. So it's highly state dependent as well. And I think it also depends on like um, certain insurances, like we have some employer based insurances. You know, uh, there are some employers that provide coverage for IVF. And then, you know, the family just has to pay for the cost of PGTM test development or even that is covered. Most of the time when I work with my patients, I write them a letter of medical necessity because we are trying to prevent genetic disease. And, you know, the insurances many a times will take that letter of medical necessity and provide coverage in states that don't have coverage. But great point, Dr. Arian. Okay, so uh, we are with one hour and 37 minutes of our webinar. I think it was a great success. Many people are congratulations of the speakers. And I also congratulate you and thank you again for your effort to be here, commitment. I know it's difficult to work, prepare slides, everything. I know that Dr. Eric, he needs to leave very soon. So I think we we can- I will later on the East Coast. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Eric, do you want to say something? Oh, no, no, no. Thank you. No, no. So I'm on the East Coast, so it's getting a little bit later. So um, no, thank you for having me. And um, it's a great discussion. And um, I think this field keeps, keeps improving and keeps making things better for patients and family. So yeah, so hope Thanks. to see you guys soon. Thanks. Yeah, Bye. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And reach out to us if you want. You have our uh, connections on LinkedIn or email. Yes. Guys, I, I just want to say two more things, okay? Uh, three more things, okay? And then I will uh, ask you to say the last words. So our next webinar. So Progenesis is committed with education. So we have webinars every second Wednesday of each month. It's always 3 p.m. Pacific time and 6 p.m. East time. Sometimes when it's uh, in India, it's a different time. And we have speakers uh, uh, well-renowned in US, Brazil, India. And the next one is going to be about the role of the female reproductive tract, tract with the microbiome and IVF. Besides of that, uh, I invite all of you to visit Progenesis at our booth number 1713 at ASRM, okay, next week. And the third thing is about genes. Genes is the conference organized by Progenesis. Dr. Mila, Militakur was our speaker in the last one in May 2023. So in May 31st to June 2nd of 2024, we are going to have the second version of genes. 
And we invite all of you, all embryologists, uh, REI, geneticists about genetics, REI, embryology, and all the trends in the field of IVF. Dr. Nabil, do you want to say something else? No, I, I think you've said it all. Thank you, everyone, for your uh, participation. Maybe we can take uh, Dr. Uh, Arian uh, last word and uh, Dr. Takur before we wrap up. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was great, and I look forward to seeing you and meeting you in person at the ASRM and uh, looking forward to having more of these webinars. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for having me on the panel. For those that are joining from other countries, like I saw some participants from Peru, Brazil, and uh, some from India, you know, I would uh, love to get connected and find out how the genetic testing is happening in those countries. And, you know, we will meet at ASRM if you're going to be there. Thank yeah, you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank bye, -bye. You. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye bye.